All right, so clearly we're heading straight back to the 1970s, all right? And this is a piece from a memoir that I'm uh, working on. So let me know afterwards if you like it. If you don't like it, you can go fuck yourself. I don't really care. But uh, we're going we're gonna to get started on this. All right, it is the, uh, the Honolulu Boys Club. <laughs> the bistro on Kapiolani Street in Waikiki was dark. No windows lit in the Hawaiian sun to see hula dancers, ukulele strummers, and Midwestern tourists. It was dimly lit with dark booths and dark carpet. Truth be told, although it really was at the bistro, daylight would have ruined the place, like a roll of undeveloped film. But in this strange lens-flared haze of the late 1970s, the bistro became the Honolulu Boys Clubhouse. Of course, the Honolulu boys were not boys at all and hadn't been for at least two decades or more. They were a middle-aged, ragtag group of functioning alcoholics, big tippers, sons of bitches, or men about town, depending on who you asked. They were all nut-brown from poolside poker games and so prone to lying about eating live monkey brains in Thailand or snorting coke off of Farrah Fawcett's thighs or karate-chopping muggers in New York that at a certain point, the lies became competitive. The boys stopped questioning the veracity of these stories and started grading them on sheer balls out bravado. The core members of this Honolulu Boys Club were my dad, who I'm dressed as, a doctor whose clinic was on the third floor of the Hyatt Regency, a Brooklyn born bookie named Hookie, hotel managers Nick and Russ, a journalist for the Honolulu Star Bulletin named Dave, a businessman alias Irv, and that is an alias, who made millions from a dry oil well, and a tough bastard named Marty. Now, nobody really knew what the hell Marty did. He was just the son of a boxer from New Orleans, and nobody fucked with him. Not even big Samoan guys who beat up Howleys for sport. The boys met up every Saturday night, swaggering into the bistro, clouds of Winston cigarette smoke trailing behind them as they called out, hey, you fucking turkeys, and punched each other on the, sh punched each other on the shoulders. They ate steak tartare, escargot, and my dad loved the live Maine lobster so much that bistro owner Carl once walked his soon-to-be-cooked crustacean through the restaurant on a leash. The boys dressed to impress, but they didn't amp up their style to score with the stewardesses who stopped by on layers. <laughs> of course, but they did. And it sure wasn't for the two hookers who occasionally joined them, even though the Vietnamese one would ask for the waiter to bring some whipped cream to sweeten the blowjobs that she gave under the table, hidden by the white tablecloth, only peeking out to order another Harvey wall banger. <clears throat> no. The crisp Pierre Cardin shirts, Paco Rabanne cologne, always splashed, never spritzed. Spritzing was for pussies. <laughs> Shine Gucci loafers and gold Cornuto necklaces nestled just so in graying chest hair. And diamond pinky rings were a new type of pissing contest. In this last gasp of machismo, these men try to outdo each other, not by slaying dragons, but by knowing how to apply just enough Vitalis hairspray to disguise a bald spot or look effortlessly tussled. Along with the lack of windows, this clubhouse on Kapiolani was protected by the me decades lack of handheld technologies. No iPhones, no one's wife could shriek about the kids driving her crazy, no one's mistress could text unfortunate results from a pregnancy test, no ringtone ever interrupted a joke about Raquel Welch's tits. And make no mistake, these were the golden years of canned jokes. Every real man had a stockpile of them. Observational humor, open-ended jokes and it really hadn't been invented yet. It didn't fly by the seat of your Ralph Lauren pants. Nobody made jokes with open-ended punchlines punch like, why is that? What's up with that? Really? <laughs> Fuck no. These jokes were rehearsed. Okay, I think my mustache is gonna come off soon, so let's just prepare for that. <laughs> These jokes were rehearsed, delivered with clockwork timing, passed from man to man at cocktail parties, written down, published in Playboy, sold in books like the world's best dirty jokes by Mr. J. These jokes were shorthand, code. They defined manhood. Regular guys, not professional comics, had to have the best, freshest jokes for any given social situation. It was humiliating if someone finished the joke for you that they'd heard before. Okay, here it comes. All right, we'll put it there for now. <laughs> or worse, that you told it before. Now, my dad, he always went for the doctor jokes. So, I uh, saw this woman the other day. She was like this, huh? Terrible arthritis in both hands. Just awful. <laughs> and Marty, he was the master of dick jokes. All right, guy walks into a whorehouse. He says, I got five cocks. Hooker says, wow, how do your pants fit? Guy says, like a glove. <laughs> Herb went for the absurdist humor. Two cannibals are eating a clown. One says to the other, does this taste funny to you? 
<laughs> the rest of the boys had a steady rotation of jokes cobbled together from equal parts Raquel Welch's tits, the Pope, assorted rabbis, ethnic stereotypes, and farts. In this dark, highly air-conditioned lair with no technological interruptions, you could win arguments even if you were wrong. Truth-dodging loudmouths ruled the room. People did not have irrefutable proof at their fingertips. So when you argued that, statistically speaking, Mansell was better than Mays, no one could Google it and tell you that you were full of shit. Arguments would simply go on for hours and hours, getting louder and louder as the boys got drunker and drunker, ordering scotch, Jack and Cokes, and once when my dad was just so plastered, a martini, which was just so damn hilarious that they started ordering every martini like that. With no internet access, no windows, no wives, no outside influences or distractions at all, the Honolulu boys created a mythological world. No one could tell them that they weren't young, vibrant, and full of promise. Instead of knocking on 40, teetering on divorce, and getting paunchy from too much booze and Bernays sauce, the mythology was fireproof. They concocted plots for movies that would never be filmed, hatched business plans that would never succeed, the most famous being the three-legged pantyhose scheme. And my dad hashed out ideas for books that would never be written. All right, listen to this. So the book is called Hold On To My Ankles, Please, right? Okay, so you know how I came up with that title? So years ago, I'm doing a pap smear. I'm going in with the speculum, and I say to the nurse, okay, hold on to my ankles, please. Two seconds later, I turn around, and she is! That dumb bitch is actually holding on to my fucking ankles! Unhindered by fact checkers, they engaged in what passes for intellectual discourse when everyone is sloshed. How many capital cities start with the letter P? If you were balling Siamese twins, what position would you do it in? What really happened to the crew of Flight 19 back in 1945? But more than anything, the clubhouse on Kapiolani was a place where potential was shielded from practical application. Potential was fragile and might disintegrate outside of that sunless cave. Real life had a way of shitting on potential. So stories were told about what could have been, what would have been, achievements that should have been, if only life weren't so riddled with lousy luck and ambitious thieves. History was rewritten at the bistro by these runner-ups, these actors left on the cutting room floor, these William Dawes of Honolulu. Like, for example, the legend of our Irv. And Mike, this is your music cue. The legend of how Irv almost invented the electronic tax return. So, uh, I was at a CPA convention in New Orleans back in 61. Crazy city. There was this uh, convention of morticians staying in the same hotel as us. So, like, all these creepy guys were standing around with the jet black hair, all wearing jet black mortician suits with pasty, you know, mayonnaise-colored skin. And the wives were there, too. And that's the part that got me. The wives all did their makeup to look like corpses, right? You know, like ash gray faces and, like, fucking blue lips. It was like the only way they could get their husbands to notice them was to look like dead people. Scared the shit out of me. I couldn't look at them. Wouldn't eat in the same room as these people. I swear to fucking God, they smell like formaldehyde. So, about two o'clock in the morning, one of these corpse wives comes into my pitch dark room, drunk out of her mind. She must have thought I was her creep mortician husband, because she puts her ice cold hand on my schwanz and starts massaging it. I almost crapped my pants, only I wasn't wearing any. I like to sleep nude. But it was like the Grim Reaper come to give me a fucking hand job. So I jump up, flip on the lights, and say, What the hell is going on? And of course, like I say, I'm nude. Then her husband barges in. I don't know, I guess they were staying next door. So he says, what the hell is going on in here? Well, so then the corpse wife just runs out of the room. Whole thing upset me so much, I left the convention two days early. I get back home to find out she made up some bullshit story about me assaulting her just to save face with her husband. So I get fired. Bad time in my career for this to happen, cause I had just about perfected the electronic tax return. Truth was malleable, dictated not by the boundaries of fact, but the boundaries of the bistro. As soon as they left that dark den, reality ruined everything. Lying may have been reviewed at the bistro, but it had a decidedly different effect at home. Outside of this clubhouse, their behavior wasn't as acceptable. Worse, real life, it just wasn't as cinematic. You couldn't guarantee a chorus of approval, smiling faces, your personal laugh track, thighs and back stinging from being slapped so hard. Hijacks that would have been revered and embellished by the boys. Like, for example, something my dad did, pitching your infant kid over a balcony at a park and just at a party and just casually yelling out, catch, to anyone down below. That just wasn't as amusing to your wife, especially stern, no-nonsense Finnish women like my mom. 
life outside the bistro started to feel stifling. People like my mom who dealt in facts and daily routines seemed dull and lacking in imagination. So my dad began to wonder, why did there have to be a boundary between the bistro and his real life? Why couldn't it all blend together? What was the worst that could happen? All right, if you want to know, let's hope this gets published. So, <laughs> thank you.